SpaceX has been busy this week in Boca Chica working towards the next iteration of the Starship. The Mark III version is underway now and huge construction efforts going on at the facility itself. A load of components have arrived from the Florida facility and the Mark I now deconstructed or very close to. We've heard a lot more about the Falcon 9's mysterious second stage performance tests from the CRS-19 mission where an unexpected drone ship landing took place instead of the typical return to landing site. Now some interesting new information as well on Starlink and new tests underway with a satellite in the next batch due to launch soon. And finally some quick updates on Rocket Lab's Electron rocket which are certainly newsworthy. Loads to cover today so let's get stuck into it. Now, although we can't yet see a new set of stacked rings for the Mark III Starship in Boca Chica, there certainly is a massive amount of work going on. There's been loads of deliveries coming in lately and some beautiful footage here taken by Lab Padre shows a great shot of the Go Discovery vessel arriving at Boca Chica to deliver cargo shipped down from the site at Florida. This here is a new bulkhead that was constructed at the Coco facility and also a bunch of new steel rolls arriving on the ship here as well. Along with this we can see two of the massive test stands and of course we saw these test stands at the Florida site from John's footage around a month ago. Then we saw the stand disappear in one of the more recent videos. Further deconstruction of the Mark I vessel occurred this week and they were, well, let's say pretty brutal about it. What do you think? We're likely to see some of this steel recycled into a Cybertruck. I think Tim's hanging out to buy one Elon, so, you know, make it happen. But there's still a massive amount of construction work going on at the facility itself, especially around the launch and the landing site. The super heavy pad is still getting a lot of attention, and when you really take a look and step back and compare the site to what it was at the start of the year, it's almost unrecognizable now. You can just imagine how it's going to look in another six months or so. The crew creating the ring segments have been keeping up the pace, and I think four have been created now, maybe one or two more than that. I suspect over the next week or two we'll finally be seeing the ring segments stacked and welded together. Let's hope that all of the process goes more smoothly for the third iteration of the design than it did for the first. So yes, a lot going on in Boca Chica. How far do you think we are from seeing some of these ring segments stacked up? Have you seen any more relevant updates that have occurred since this video was uploaded? Let us all know what you think in the comments. Now in last week's video I talked about it being unusual for the commercial resupply service mission to be landing on a drone ship. In the case of CRS-19, which landed on the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You, there was a number of questions around why this ocean landing was required. We covered the news that indicated that the second stage needed more performance for thermal testing during the deorbit burn around six hours after being released from the Dragon. But apart from that, there was not a lot known about what it was all about. Now as planned, the second upper stage did indeed perform a six hour coast phase followed by a successful deorbit burn. Now this wasn't the first time an upper stage had attempted a long coast phase. In fact, this was the third time it's been done like this. As has been reported though, no other six hour coast has also included an engine burn. As it turns out, this test had been requested by the US Air Force so that they could determine the feasibility for future SpaceX provided missions that could potentially launch national security payloads into a direct geosynchronous Earth orbit. A SpaceX official early in the week reported that SpaceX engineers added baffles to the second stage tanks to help stop propellant from pooling on the tank walls. The the Falcon Heavy Space Test Program 2 mission back in June of 2019 was of course a Department of Defense mission managed by the US Air Force and that was certainly one of the most, if not probably the most, challenging launch SpaceX has completed so far. This mission had four separate upper stage engine burns, three separate deployment orbits and then a deorbit burn. Now although this mission was completely successful, the engineers did not quite see the results they were hoping for with the stage two. So all these new improvements are aimed at reducing risk for longer duration missions. And because these improvements apply to the upper stage used on both Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy missions, we could be seeing some huge payloads heading to direct geosynchronous orbits in future missions. 
Now a geosynchronous orbit is an orbit much further out than SpaceX's vessels generally travel. It's essentially an orbit that allows satellites to match the Earth's rotational speed. This is extremely beneficial for communications, surveillance and monitoring weather patterns as a satellite in this type of orbit returns to the same position after each sidereal day. Now often people are confused with the difference between the terms geosynchronous and geostationary in relation to orbit types. A geostationary orbit is a geosynchronous orbit but it's a very specific orbit rotating directly on the Earth's equatorial plane. That would mean that for an observer on the ground the satellite is always in the same fixed position in the sky. This can be handy for when you want to set up fixed ground based hardware such as roof antennas that point to unmoving pay TV satellites and whatnot. Geosynchronous orbits though can sit at any inclination and so for a ground based observer these can move quite a lot during the course of the day and they can therefore be positioned in quite interesting ways to achieve all kinds of goals. You can see from sites such as this one here, Stuff in Space, just how popular these orbits are. Here we can see that a geostationary orbit is clearly very popular right over the equator. Other orbits we see at the same distances here have different inclinations, which essentially just means the orbit has an angle or tilt when compared to the equatorial plane. And most of these in general will be other geosynchronous orbits. At around 35,786 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, these orbits share very similar orbital periods. And you can check these out just by clicking around the map here. Now typically the Air Force has been quite reliant on ULA's Atlas V rocket to send their payloads into these orbits, but for SpaceX to be able to fly these missions they needed to show that they could actually do it. There are some contracts already planned late next year, so as long as SpaceX can continue to prove the reliability of the second stage after these much longer coast phases, that will be some great news. During the week we got to watch the booster return on the drone ship, of course I still love you. Amazing footage here on NASA a space flight. Here we can see the Falcon 9 booster returning and I just love these shots when there are people in the view just for reference. I mean just look how massive the Falcon 9 booster is compared to the support crew here. Now just imagine the size of the upcoming Starship boosters which are just a ridiculous amount larger again. The tank of the Falcon 9 booster here is 12 feet in diameter or um, 3.7 meters. The Starship booster will be around 9 meters in diameter. That is going to be insane. On to some Starlink news now with some interesting statements made again by Gwen Shotwell. It seems like one Starlink satellite in the next mission is going to be treated with a special coating in order to see if SpaceX can reduce the reflectivity of the satellites in future batches. Now the reason for this is pretty obvious right, if you've been browsing around news articles on Starlink recently there is a fair uproar from communities around the world very unhappy with what the proposed network may all mean for future Australia. Astronomy. I've had a lot of comments asking what my opinion about all this is and I can certainly see why there are so many concerns. Back in May when the first batch of 60 satellites was launched, astronomers and general observers were amazed at how bright the constellation was as it passed overhead. It was extremely noticeable at first of course as there is this amazing train of them all screaming overhead. At the time of course they were still getting into position, raising their orbits and at the time they were more than likely not positioned 100% correctly. But this is something that has never been seen before and the worry is that a much larger network will certainly interfere with scientific research in astronomy, not only in the visible light spectrum but also in other wavelengths such as near infrared. And look many of these are legitimate concerns right, as soon as we have a network of this magnitude the night sky is certainly going to be affected somewhat especially if no action is taken to lessen the reflectivity problem. I mean. I believe the network itself is going to be a wonderful thing if it is done with all the necessary considerations that need to be made. And the statements made by Gwen Shotwell this week are very encouraging saying that SpaceX is going to get this done. Now the one satellite in the next batch will have a new coating on the bottom. It's only experimental at this moment as the coating will presumably cause new issues that will need testing and further consideration. It may not work initially but they'll trial and tweak the design to figure out the 
the best way to get this done. It's an interesting issue because to keep satellites cool, reflecting light away is a great way to minimize heat from being absorbed. A coating that absorbs a lot of this sunlight in order to make it less reflective is going to have it sucking in a lot more heat. Now Gwen Shotwell said that this is something that will be examined. It definitely changes the performance of the satellite thermally. It'll take some trial and error, but we will fix it. We want to make sure that we do the right thing to make sure kids can look through their telescopes. And astronomy is one of the things that gets kids excited about space. As it stands, SpaceX are still planning to launch batches of 60 satellites every few weeks over the upcoming year. Global coverage, although limited, may even be possible by mid-2020, which is just mind-boggling to think about considering that only two launches have occurred so far. Now, there's a lot more to talk about when it comes to the Starlink satellite network, and I've made more in-depth videos about this that are still very relevant today. If you're interested, you can check out some of these from the video feed of mine. And while you're here, of course, please do consider subscribing to the channel if I've piqued your interest here. There's loads to keep up with right now with Starship development, Starlink, and Crew Dragon progress, and I'd love to share all that with you. So what do you think about the Starlink network? Are you in favor of pushing these boundaries to create the most advanced satellite communications network ever made? Or are you opposed to the whole idea? Let me know what you think in the comments. Now, SpaceX has received massive coverage over the last few years due to the amazing recoveries of the Falcon 9 boosters, among other things. Rocket Lab are working towards reusability as well now, of course, and last week they successfully completed a guided re-entry of the Electron vehicle's first stage, and they've announced that this stage made it back to sea level intact after a guided descent. As part of their recent upgrades to the Electron's first stage, there's now better support for reusability tests such as guidance and navigation hardware to gather more information while the stage re-enters the atmosphere. And it's also now equipped with a reaction control system to help control the booster during descent. Now the RCS system successfully flipped the booster around 180 degrees for the descent and it remained dynamically stable for the re-entry keeping the correct angle of attack. The stage was successfully slowed to less than 900 kilometers per hour by the time it reached sea level and disintegrated. Now the next step next year is to attempt a full recovery using parachutes deployed from Electron's first stage to allow a soft water landing. After that, of course, the plan is to catch the boosters right out of the air, which I just can't wait to see. Now, I know most of my audience here is all over SpaceX, but Rocket Lab is doing some incredible stuff, and there really are some very unique benefits to Rocket Lab's technology, as well as the unique launch location in New Zealand. Now, as Peter Beck said earlier in the year, in a TED talk, we're in the dawn of a new space revolution, the revolution of the small. Now, I know I do focus a lot on the massive payloads and SpaceX launches such as Starlink, but the capability to launch small payloads to space rapidly and reliably is also extremely incredible. We really are seeing huge advancements on what we can achieve with very small satellites. If you haven't seen Peter Beck's TED talk from April 2019, there's a link to that in the description. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do take a second and hit that like button. A huge thank you to my quality control squad here for helping me research and proof the material for these videos. If you're interested in these topics and would like to be part of this, follow my Discord or Twitter link in the description and please do get in touch. In the title in the bottom left today, we have my video showing a condensed summary with all the best SpaceX footage I could find. The audience really enjoyed that one, so if you haven't seen that, check that out here. In the top right is my latest video, and in the bottom right, a video that YouTube has selected from my channel just for you. Thank you everyone for watching, and we'll see you all in the next video.